Hi, it's Chris Flanagan. Welcome to the Pediatric Emergencies Podcast. So today I've got something a little bit different for you. I want to talk about leadership in a pediatric emergency. So I was recently doing a case-based discussion with one of the trainees on this exact topic, and it was a really good discussion, and it actually made me think I should put some of this down as a podcast. So before a lot of you think, oh no, this is going to be a really boring talk on theory, and switch off, let me see if I can reassure you by mentioning two things. So firstly, if you're familiar with this podcast, you'll know that's not something I do. Um, Anything I do has to be practical. So I'm not going to go into a whole load of theory and a detailed talk on leadership that has absolutely no benefit to you. I'm going to keep it short and sweet and simple and give you practical tips on how you can make a real difference to your patient. The second thing is that I think this is probably one of the most important talks that I'm going to do. Um, Most people are obsessed with improving their knowledge and improving their practical skills. And they feel that using a combination of these, they can make big differences to their patient outcomes. But if you don't focus on your leadership, you can't. And actually what I'm gonna teach you isn't that difficult. And if you're not currently leading effectively and you bring these small changes into your practice, it's going to have a massive benefit to your patients, much more than any piece of knowledge or skills can do. So you're going to get a lot of bang for your buck from what I'm going to teach you. Okay, so a lot of what I'm going to teach you with leadership can be directly related to human factors. And as I've already mentioned, this isn't going to be a detailed lecture on the theory of human factors. I'm certainly not an expert and not in a position to give that. But what I am going to do is going to give you some key learning points um, related to human factors so that you can introduce these into your practice and hopefully make a difference to the next critically ill child that comes through your doors. Um, So what are human factors? So if you were to do an internet search, you'd find numerous definitions on human factors. And a lot of them, you wouldn't be any the wiser having read them. Um, So I want to quote Martin Bromley's definition of human factors because for me, I think it's the one that makes the most sense. So Martin says human factors are about making it easy to do the right things and hard to do the wrong things. It's about how we design our systems and processes, our tools, our environments, and it's also about how we behave, how we think, and finding ways to think and behave that make it easy to do the right thing, and again, easy for those around you to do the right things. Okay, so before I start, I want to tell you the story about how I discovered the importance of effective leadership and human factors. And in fact, my eyes were opened to the importance of these really quite late in my career, when I was in my final year as a registrar in my paediatric intensive care training. So, While working as the senior registrar on call in a large paediatric intensive care, I was called down urgently to the medical ward to see a patient with life-threatening asthma. This was a child I'd met a number of times before and had numerous intensive care admissions. And by the time I got down to the ward, it became quite clear the child was in extremis. So this was a situation I felt fairly confident to manage I got on with directing care, delivered PEEP with an nurse tea piece, oxygen, got nebulizers in, started intravenous bronchodilators. Um, and over the next five minutes or so, it became quite obvious that this child was going to need intubated on the paediatric ward. Ideally, I would rather have transferred them to the intensive care because intubating a patient with asthma, there's a high risk of them arresting immediately on induction or shortly after induction. That's the, the high risk period. So although I was confident in what I was doing, um, as this was a high-risk intubation, um, I phoned up and got my intensive care consultant to come down to the ward. So she arrived down on the ward, um, bringing another paediatric intensive care registrar with her. And she says, I'm happy you've got this. Um, I'm going to go and stand at the back of the room. I'm here if you want me, but otherwise I want you to continue and lead this. So um, I led the team, 
I organise the equipment for intubation, give directions on what drugs, how I wanted them given. Um, I use the colleague that had been brought down to pass me equipment during the intubation. I carried out a lovely slick intubation, made sure I didn't hyperventilate the patient afterwards, allowing time for her to get back out of the chest. Um, got the patient safely transferred up to the unit, dealt with a silent chest there with um, sebofluorine and inserted slick intravenous lines, set the ventilator up perfectly and in my eyes had done an absolutely perfect job. Um, and as it's rare to have a consultant watching you the whole time while you're doing all this, um, afterwards I'd said to her, would you mind doing a case discussion for me on that? So um, later on that day, uh, once we got things sorted out, I sat down with a consultant to do a case-based discussion on what I was expecting to be the management of life-threatening asthma, something I knew inside out and something I was absolutely certain I had done a 100% good job on with this patient. Um, and for me, this was case discussion was a box ticking exercise, but I was going to get a form filled in, something I needed for my training. Um, and I was a little bit surprised when I sat down with the consultant. She said, OK, um, I want to have a chat about leadership and human factors. She then went on to point out that when she arrived on the ward, she had brought down another experienced paediatric intensive care registrar who I had used to pass me equipment during the intubation while I continued to lead and also do the intubation. She suggested to me that an alternative approach would have been to have asked that registrar to go and take over the airway. This would have allowed me to go and stand at the bottom of the bed and focus on just leading. And this to me made perfect sense. Um, the intubation, putting the tube in, wasn't the difficult bit. And in fact, my colleague was just as capable of me as doing this. And this would then have freed me up to focus on just the leading, something I was doing as well as the intubation. The consultant went on to point out that actually, while I was leading, and doing the intubation, I couldn't be doing both tasks as effectively as I could. And this was the first time I had actually really ever give this much thought, but it actually made perfect sense. So the consultant explained to me that the medicine wasn't actually that difficult. This was something I knew how to do in my sleep, but the leadership it was actually the interesting bit of this case and it was only when you led effectively getting the best out of each of your team members supporting them developing them that you could really get the best outcomes for your patient so my eyes were completely opened to something i had been neglecting for so long i had been focusing solely on knowledge and practical skills and hadn't really thought much about leadership. So I went away hungry for more knowledge. How could I learn more about this? Because this had a real potential to improve the outcomes for my patients. And this was something that up until now, I had been completely neglecting. And as it turns out, this isn't that difficult. There's obviously the, the topic is massive and there's textbooks and textbooks on it. But to get started, there's really only a couple of practical things you need to remember. And this is going to form the basis for the rest of this talk, the key learning points. So the first one I want to start with, and that is you can't lead and do another task at the same time and expect to do both effectively. Um, so practically, what does this mean? So this means that during any emergency situation, one person needs to stand at the bottom of the bed where they can see the patient, the team, the monitors, everything that's going on, and focus just on the leading. They need to avoid touching the patients themselves, getting involved with a particular procedure, or one bit of the management. Because what happens then, if they get fixated on that, 
they lose the bigger picture, the whole picture of what's going on with that patient. So like I said, they need to stand back and keep an overview on everything. Okay, so to illustrate this point, I want to give you an example that I think will be familiar to almost everyone. So a child comes into the emergency department with meningococcal septicemia. Intravenous access is difficult and the SHU in the register can't get a cannula. So before long, the consultant starts to try on another limb, quickly followed by the paediatric intensive care team arriving, who are told that intravenous access is difficult in this child with meningococcal septicemia, so they try another limb. Nobody is really paying much attention to the monitor. There's no clear leader. And when the nurses mention that the vital signs have worsened, they're met with a hmm. Mm. I'm just about to get this. Um, pass, pass me another cannula. And it wouldn't be unusual for 15, 20 minutes to pass by. Um, but for those who are trying to get the intravenous line, it feels like only a few minutes. And what's the big problem here? The problem is that the doctors involved have forgotten about the original problem of meningococcal septicemia. They're now focusing on the new problem of obtaining intravenous access. So what's happened? They've become task fixated. And when nurses are speaking to them about the deteriorating observations or asking them questions, they can't actually hear what the nurse is saying. They're focusing so hard on getting the line in. They don't hear the monitors alarming. Their only goal is to get that intravenous line because they become task fixated. And in fact, that's a really, really dangerous situation to be in. So I now want you to imagine the same situation, but this time the consultant stands at the bottom of the bed, keeps their situational awareness of everything that's going on. So you can be almost certain that after a couple of minutes of trying for an intravenous line, the consultant is certainly going to order the insertion of an intraosseous line and let's get on with the resuscitation. So if you try and do a task while you're leading, you risk becoming fixated with the task and losing the bigger picture. And actually, you probably will end up not doing either of the tasks well. So this still relates to the initial key learning point is that you can't lead and do a task at the same time and expect to do them both well because you will probably become task fixated. Or even if you're not task fixated, that task will be taking up the concentration that you should be using to lead effectively. Okay, so I now want to look at this point in a few different groups of people. So say you're very junior and you're not normally the team leader. Is what I'm telling you still relevant for you? Well, it is. When you're the first to arrive um, at a critically ill child, you are the team leader until help comes. There's also other patients that aren't sick enough initially to require calling a whole team for. Um, but while you're looking after them, there is the potential for them to deteriorate. So if you become task fixated, you may miss that deterioration and not call for the additional help early enough. So what can you do? Well, I think the first thing you can do is recognize that when you're doing a particular task, there's a risk of you becoming task fixated. So you won't be watching overall what's going on with your patient as well as you would be if you weren't doing a particular task. So one way around this is to maybe ask the nurse who's there with you to watch the patient while you're doing your particular procedure and to let you know if such and such happens or for the nurse to let you know after you've been trying for 10 minutes so that you can take a step back and reassess the patient before continuing on with the procedure. So again, you're recognising that you're at risk of becoming task fixated while doing a procedure and not assessing your patient fully during that time period and you're putting sort of safeguarding measures into place, be it a nurse watching you, letting you know of X or Y happens, 
are telling you when you've been trying for so long so that you can step back and reassess the patient. The other thing that's useful is if you're at a resuscitation scenario and there is more senior people involved, let's pick that meningococcal case that we've just discussed, and you see that nobody is standing back and leading. You can do one of two things. You can either point that out or you as yourself can say, okay, I'm going to stand back and watch so that at least one person is standing back and watching the whole patient so that not everybody in the room is getting sucked in to becoming task fixated. And then at the other end of the spectrum, um, there's the situation I often find myself in where I'm the person leading, but I'm also the best person to do the intubation or insert the central line. So how should I manage that? Well, the first thing is to recognise that I can't do both effectively at the same time. So I can't lead while doing a practical procedure and expect to do them both of them to the best of my ability. So what are the options? Well, firstly, the preferred option, and this is what um, my consultant pointed out to me when I was the registrar intubating that asthmatic patient, was to ask an equally skilled person to come along and do the procedure while you continue to lead. So this is obviously better than doing the procedure yourself and handing the leadership over to somebody else because that involves an unnecessary handover. Um, the original person is much better to stay leading while the procedure requires no handover. I need you to come and intubate this patient. I need you to put a central line in while you stay and keep leadership of the patient. Um, but that frequently isn't always an option. There's not always an equally skilled person to do that procedure. So I think the first thing that needs to be happening is there needs to be an alarm bells going off in your head when you're having to leave that leadership role to do a procedure that you're at risk of becoming task fixated. So you've kind of highlighted that to yourself at the start. So you're hopefully it's less likely to happen. Um, and the second thing is I won't be watching my patient as closely while I'm doing that procedure. So you need to plan for that. And I think the, the biggest thing in doing that is to hand the team leadership role over to somebody else while you're doing that procedure. Um, the person taking over the leadership role, you're probably going to have to give them a bit more of a briefing. So if this happens, I want you to do this. If this happens, I want you to do this. If I've been trying for longer than this amount of time, I want you to let me know so I can step back and reassess the situation. It's similar to what the, the novice should be doing. You're setting up a safety net while you're away from that team leadership role. And then once the procedure is done, you can come back and take up the leadership role again. So again, um, another case to illustrate this. So while inserting a central line in a critically ill child, the child starts to deteriorate. Um, the nurse is pointing out problems to the doctor doing the line. The blood pressure is this. What do you want me to do with the adrenaline or the noradrenaline? The blood gas has deteriorated. It's now showing this. What should I do? So the line's actually difficult and it's requiring a lot of the doctor's concentration. They have to get the line in because they know that they need the line to give all the medications the child needs to survive, but also the child needs things adjusted while they're doing the line. They're only half listening to what the nurse is saying. They're giving inadequate answers, aren't able to focus on the line, so aren't getting the line in. So again, they're trying to do two things at once. They're trying to lead while doing a practical procedure. And as a result, they're not doing either effectively. So what do they need to do? Well, the easiest thing is they need to call somebody else to come and lead while they're doing the procedure. So another senior doctor needs to come, stand at the bottom of the bed and deal with the resuscitation and stabilization of that child, leaving the person doing the line free to focus on just getting that critical line in um, because the child needs that line but they also need leadership while the line is being inserted and the same person 
County Both, effectively. And I'm sure many of you, um, this situation is familiar. While you're trying to do a practical procedure, be it insertion of a line, an intubation, you can remember the nurses talking to you or telling you certain things. You only hear half of what they say. It takes you about 20 seconds to give a garbled answer back to them because you're focusing so hard on the task that you're doing, you're not processing the information and your answer is completely ineffective. So we need to recognize this is something we can't do. So in the situation that we've just discussed, it's, I need you to get me so-and-so to come at the bottom of the bed and lead while I focus on doing this line. Again, once the line's done, you can take up the leadership role again. I'm assuming in this scenario it was an unrecognised deterioration during the line insertion. Um, but had this been anticipated, it would have been much better for the doctor who had been already leading to have called that equally senior person in advance and asked them to do the procedure rather than getting scrubbed up and doing the line themselves. So again, you need to remember you can't lead and do a task at the same time and expect to do both effectively. So and I want to go on and look at how you can make changes to the system to help avoid the problems that we have discussed and make it easier to lead in an emergency. And at its best, this can look like a Formula One team doing a pit stop. Emergency care can be just that slick where everybody knows their role, what they're doing, everybody's working together towards the same common goal. And I think a really good example of this is the structured trauma team. So in the structured trauma team, every member has a specific role, the specific place to stand around the bed space, the bibs on with their role on it, and you've got a team leader standing at the bottom of the bed. The team leader doesn't put hands on the patient. They've got a scribe standing beside them, documenting and timing everything that's been done. And in that situation, it's clear who's in charge. Every team member has a pre-allocated role and set of goals to do. And everybody in that team is working towards the same goal. We need to be in CT in 20 minutes. We're going to avoid any unnecessary interventions. And that just makes leadership really, really straightforward, which is so important when you're dealing with such a critically ill patient. Another example of a systems change is a pre-intubation checklist. And the one up on the screen now is the paediatric emergencies pre-intubation checklist. So that just makes the whole process of intubation safer. It ensures you have all the right equipment, you've all the right you've thought about all the right things beforehand of the patient fasting, there's a gastric tube in, and you've briefed the team. Everybody's got a role. You've anticipated what can go wrong before it happens and what you're gonna do with it, do about it. So again, a systems change that makes leadership easier. Another example, an emergency drugs calculator. Um, this again goes back to when I was a paediatric SHO. I noticed that in an emergency situation, it took an absolute lifetime from the doctor requesting an inotropic infusion, for example, to when it was calculated, because everything had to be calculated on the child's weight. It was a different, it was made up in different ways depending on the child's weight. So from when it was calculated to when it was actually made up and connected and running, this took an absolute lifetime. And certainly um, influenced the outcome to those critically ill patients who needed the infusion immediately. So at that stage, I designed um, Pediatric Intensive Care Calculator, which is an emergency drug calculator that could be run on your smartphone. So the idea was the doctor would take it out in the bed space, type in the child's weight, and it would give you all the critical infusions you needed for that child. And importantly, tell you how to make it up, what rate to run on that, so there'll be no delay in giving it to that critically ill child. So this obviously made sense, should improve the care delivered in an emergency, but obviously you need to compare it against the gold standard. And at the time that was the BNFC for children. 
So I designed a study um, It involved all 28 of the doctors and the seven medical students who were attached to the paediatric department of a district general hospital. They were given the hypothetical scenario of a child with meningococcal septicemia and were asked to prescribe a dopamine infusion and an adrenaline infusion for a hypotensive child. For one of the scenarios, they used the BNFC, and for the other scenario, they used the PICU calculator on the iPhone. And the results really were quite alarming, but reflected on what I had seen in practice. So using the BNFC in 10 minutes in a calm, quiet environment, only 29% of participants were able to correctly work out the infusion whereas 100%, including all the medical students, were able to do so using the smartphone. It also was significantly quicker. It saved over five minutes per calculation. And also you got the right answer at the end of the time compared to a wrong answer most of the time using the standard method. And actually using the smartphone, medical students outperformed consultants when they used the BNFC. So a really simple systems change that improved outcomes in an emergency. And you can imagine leading the scenario using a bit of technology like this compared to the chaos created with a paper-based um, formulary, having to look it up, do the calculations, the delay in getting that medicine to that child, the, the change in the room and the atmosphere in that team compared to the team that just looks it up on a f smartphone this is what it is, mix it up, presses go on the pump. There's a real difference. So based on this, um, I went on and developed a more detailed um, application. That's the Pediatric Emergencies application, where um, it's for each of the emergencies. You've got an algorithm from a well-recognized source, such as um, APLS, and it's got all the doses and equipment calculated um, that you need to manage that emergency. And we now have iPads in each of the paediatric treatment rooms and the paediatric wards and in each of the paediatric resuscitation bays in the emergency departments in Northern Ireland. So this has been a systems change that has improved the way we can deliver emergency care to critically ill children. And what I would encourage you to do is look at the systems and the way you operate in an emergency. Is there anything that you could change to improve the outcomes? and not get suckered into the same trap as this is the way we've always done it. We need to always continue doing it the same way. Constantly challenge your practice, look at ways to improve outcomes. Um, another example is simulation training. Um, if I go back to the example I gave before of that Formula One team doing a pit stop, they have rehearsed that inside out so that when it happens for real during the race, they are prepared and ready for it. And dealing with an emergency resuscitation of a critically ill child needs to be exactly the same. You need to be training in your teams for those scenarios so that when it happens, you're a well-oiled machine so that you can deliver medical care that can be likened to that um, Formula One team doing a pit stop. That should be our aim. And you can't do that without practice. So simulation training, working in your teams, is a great way to do that. Make your mistakes during your simulation training. Identify faults in your systems so that you can rectify them so they don't have to have a, an adverse outcome for that real patient. Um, I like to often run mock scenarios in my head, purposely making them as difficult or as complex as I can. And I find that a great way to identify problems, identify systems failures, um, so that I can then deal with them. So when that real child comes through the doors, I'm ready for them. Um, an example of this might be, um, how do I administer potassium via peripheral line for due to a hypokalemic cardiac arrest? Um, and I think a lot of you won't have an answer to that straight away. I had to go off and research what's the dose, how do I do it. Um, it turns out you can use a, a bag of normal saline with 20 millimoles of potassium. There's a way you can calculate the dose and how quickly can you give it. But unless you've thought about all that in advance, 
um, you're not going to be able to do it when it happens. So I like to run these scenarios in my head, make them as difficult as I can. And then when I find a solution, what I do is I add it into the Pediatric Emergencies app. So you'll see in the app under cardiac arrest, there's a dose for potassium and a recipe for giving it in a cardiac arrest. And that's so important. If you always wait until the problem happens, you're not always going to be able to think on your feet or be able to come up with the answers in the time you need them. So now I want to go on and look at communication. And good communication is absolutely vital for effective leadership. So hopefully I've now convinced you that it's important that somebody is in charge at all times during an emergency situation. But that's not enough. People need to know who this is. So it's important that whoever is leading the team makes that clear. I'm going to lead this. Um, and the high risk scenario where actually no one takes leadership and there's a bit of confusion over who's leading it and actually the people who are leading for part of it think somebody else is leading and they both think each other is actually leading it um, happens when there's multiple senior people off the same level so you have a group of three registrars from different specialties or three consultants from different specialties for example that child with meningococcal septicemia you could well have an emergency department consultant, a paediatric consultant, and a PICU consultant or anaesthetic consultant, all there. And unless one of them says, I'm going to lead this, there can be a bit of confusion over who's leading. Each of them thinking the other is leading, and nobody is actually leading effectively. So it's important that one person declares, I'm going to lead this. This is also important because it keeps a controlled calm environment um, for leadership and all the communication should go through the team leader what you don't want is each of those consultants shouting out orders and giving instructions one of them should be doing that the others can be making their suggestions via the team leader who then again orders that intervention but what you don't want is lots of people shouting out orders there's chaos and one person again doesn't have control of the whole situation. The team leader needs to stand back, take control and if people have suggestions and comments by all means they should be encouraged but they should come through the team leader. Also how the team leader asks for something can make a massive difference. So I want you to compare the following. So you've got a team leader who shouts to the room I want an adrenaline infusion started stat. And you compare this to the team leader saying, John, I want you to make up a peripheral adrenaline infusion by diluting a milligram of adrenaline in 50 mils of saline and starting the infusion at 1.2 mils an hour, which will give us 0.1 mics per kilo per minute. Can you let me know when you've done this or if you're having any problems? So the first team leader um, who shouted the instructions to the room is still likely to be waiting for his adrenaline infusion five minutes later he's going to be getting frustrated where's my adrenaline and he'll again address that request to the whole room um so what's the difference well the second team leader has given the task to a specific person has used their name so the task has been allocated to one person whereas in the first scenario it was shouted to the whole room so each person maybe assumes somebody else is going to do it. Nobody has been given ownership of the task. In the second scenario, hopefully the team leader will have gained and picked the most appropriate person to do that task. The other thing the second team leader, who's an effective team leader, has done is they have recognised this is a complex task, particularly for people who don't do it on a daily basis and has so provided instructions to make it most likely to happen in a timely manner. They've realized that this causes confusion and delay. And certainly I've seen nurses go off confused by the request. They don't want to mention to the team leader they're not sure how to make it up. So they'll go off and try and look it up in a book or they'll go and find somebody else to ask the question. 
And in a real scenario, it's not a surprise, 10 minutes later, they haven't come back with the infusion and they won't come back for 10, 20 minutes until they find somebody else who can help them because they don't want to query the team leader's instructions. So again, the smart team leader who's seen this scenario numerous times before recognizes this is a difficult task. And if they give unclear or ambiguous instructions, it won't happen in a timely manner. So they've given Pacific, taken the extra time to give the Pacific instructions. I want you to put this amount and this amount of saline, set it at this. Um, and that task is much more likely to happen. And also because they've allocated one member of the team to do it as well. The other important thing that they've done is they've encouraged the person completing the task to let them know if they're having problems. So that person is going to be much more likely to raise a query to the team leader rather than running off to find somebody else to ask. They've also asked for the loop of communication to be closed by getting that person to feedback first that they've heard and understood the task and a second to let me know when it's done. So you can see why I love this leadership stuff and how leadership and leading effectively is a real art form. And it can make such a massive difference to your patients just by comparing the simple way that the team leader has asked for something to be done. That's going to have a massive difference to that child. How quickly they get the right dose of their vasoactive drug uh, in the first scenario compared to the second scenario. And that all comes down to effective leadership. Nothing to do with knowledge or skills, but just how good you lead. So it can make a massive difference. Um, how the team leader behaves is also of vital importance. If they can stay calm, it keeps the team calm. I've already mentioned the importance of that calm, controlled environment. It's also important that the team leader encourages questions and responds to comments and challenges positively. Because what this will do, it will give the team members the confidence to speak up if they have questions or concerns. I think it's also important that as a team leader, you share your thinking with the team. Um, if you're just giving orders, it doesn't show the thinking behind them. Whereas if you think out loud as you go along, your team can see that they've considered this information, they're not doing it but for a certain reason, rather than if you do all that internally, some of the team are wondering, have they seen this? Are they really going to ignore it? Whereas if you thought out loud, I've seen this, but I'm putting it to the side for the moment, I'm going to focus on this, they can understand what you're doing it and why you're doing it. It's also important that you declare any emergency out loud. This is septic shock. This is can't intubate, can't ventilate. And the final thing I want to mention under behaviour is that leading the team effectively requires quite a bit of concentration. And having an effective and well-trained team allows the team leader to stand back and think, which is needed for those more complex and challenging cases, rather than to have to direct each of the smaller decisions, which can cause the team leader to become fixated with these small, minute details, rather than standing back and focusing on the big picture. And when a cardiac arrest is a perfect example of this, if the team leader is having to focus on pulse checks, good CPR, um, all the things that we focus on, in the resuscitation courses, um, drugs at certain times, they're missing the big picture. They're missing what's going on. What can I do to actually change this? What's the diagnosis? Whereas if they have a scribe standing at their shoulder who's watching the clock, they've already told the team when they want the adrenaline given. The team are doing a good job changing um, who's doing the compressions every time there's a pulse check. But all those things are happening naturally. 
the team leader is able to actually stand back and focus on the big picture and make those important decisions rather than getting tied down with all those small tasks. And at this stage, leading that effective team is actually really quite straightforward and actually quite enjoyable. So you can see why I love this leadership stuff. None of it's complex. It's all quite straightforward and logical. But what you need to do is think about it. And most people don't consider it. Again, they're obsessed with knowledge and practical skills. And don't put a focus on the human factors and leadership. And like I said, all the things I've shown you today are really straightforward. You just need to think about them and start putting them in to your practice. So I want to finish off today by giving you a real case. Um, hopefully the cases that I've mentioned as we've gone along, which again are all real cases, um, will have given you the importance of these human factors and effective leadership. Um, but I don't think there's a better example of a case that illustrates the importance of human factors and effective leadership than the Elaine Bromley case. And I'm sure most of you will have heard of this. So Elaine Bromley was a 37 year old woman who attended for elective sinus surgery in 2005. And due to significant failings in the care provided during her anaesthetic, she suffered hypoxic brain injury and died shortly after the procedure. And many of the errors that occurred in her case can be directly attributed to failings in human factors. And since her death, her husband, Martin Bromley, has set up the Clinical Human Factors Group with the aim of promoting an understanding of human factors in healthcare. So what I want you to do now is over on the website, pediatricemergencies.com, um, there's a video of the reconstruction of the Elaine Bromley case. This is in my video, uh, produced by another team, and it's an excellent learning resource. What I want you to do now is I want you to pause the podcast, go ahead and look at the video, and then come back to the podcast where we're going to discuss some of the features. Um, obviously, this is human factors around a failed intubation. Um, and many of you watching this will say, this isn't relevant to me. I don't deliver anaesthetics. But it is. These human factors that went wrong during this case are just as important during the resuscitation of a child, for example, in an emergency department. They could be, the problem could be intravenous access rather than an intubation. Or it could be problems with an intubation in the emergency department rather than the anaesthetic room. And although you might not be the person putting the tube in, your recognition of these problems with human factors can be just as important in that environment. Okay, so if you pause the podcast now, have a look at the first video, and in particular, look at the leadership. Is it effective? So I know this is a really hard video to watch. Um, it's hard for me to watch um, each time I do, and we show this regularly on the Pediatric Emergencies Intubation Course. But it is important that we learn from the mistakes made in this video so that we don't repeat them. Um, and there's many learning points. I'm only going to focus on them briefly here. Um, I think for me, one of the first things looking at the video is there was no plan for failure. There was no plan B. Um, there was no pre-oxygenation delivered. Um, emergency drugs weren't prepared, so they had to be drawn up um, during this scenario. And I think for me, one of the systems changes that could prevent this was a pre-intubation checklist where failure is planned for. And again, given that this is a talk on leadership, if I was to ask you who was in charge during all this, and I think it's difficult because each of them was leading at a slightly different stage, but none of them actually declared they were the leader. And as I've mentioned, this is the, the high risk scenario where you have multiple 
people of the same level and one of them has to say I'm in charge of leading this and that person then needs to step back so they can lead effectively. Each of the three consultants present, um, I think it was unclear who was in charge and that was one of the things that was mentioned. Um, people were unsure who was leading and it seemed to change at different times and importantly nobody was standing back and leading effectively. And this led to task fixation. The goal for the, in this case, change quickly to we have to intubate this patient rather than we need to provide oxygen. There was loss of control and loss of awareness causing a breakdown in the decision making process. Um, so the, the consultants involved very quickly became fixated on intubation rather than the overall care of the patient. Um, and one of the things that really showed this is they repeated the same technique again and again. And when they actually had an LMA down, they then proceeded to try and intubate down the LMA rather than thinking this is a great time to start waking the patient up again. And we're all at risk of this. We're all at risk of task fixation. And the one good way to prevent this is you need somebody who's leading, standing back, not involved in the task. And if this is the only thing you remember from this talk, um, I'll be happy. You cannot lead and do a task at the same time and expect to do both effectively. And if you as a leader become task fixated, it's a really dangerous place for your patient. Um, looking at some of the other things in this case, um, there wasn't really a structured approach followed. And again, if you as a team look at systems, if you rehearse, you learn your difficult airway algorithms, so you're all singing off the same hymn sheet, so that you try one thing, move on to another technique, move on to another technique. If this had been rehearsed in that team, um, they wouldn't have got into so much trouble. Um, again, communication wasn't good between the team members. I think, importantly, the seriousness of the situation wasn't vocalised. Like we'd mentioned, if somebody had a said, this is, can't intubate, can't ventilate, it would have very quickly changed the scenario. They would have went down the route of oxygenation rather than persisting with intubation. And one of the other big things we've mentioned in the behaviour of the team leader is that you have to be approachable. Um, the nurses in this case knew this was can't intubate, can't ventilate. One of them had the cricothyroidotomy kit in their hands, but didn't actually feel that they were in a position where they could speak up and challenge what the doctors were doing. And this is really sad. This is a culture that we have to embrace. You have how you respond to challenges, criticisms is so important. It's what keeps you safe. You have to take them positively. So like I say, these are only a few of the points. Um, but if the one thing that really could have changed this was a leader standing back and not being involved in the actual practical procedure. So the same team that um, have made the first video, the reconstruction of the case, have made a second video showing what could have happened had the team had paid more emphasis on human factors and leaderships. So again, what I want you to do now is watch the, the second What If video on the website and then come back to the podcast. So go ahead and do that now. Okay. So I think for me, the big difference in this one was just the leadership. When the second anaesthetist came into the room, he right at the start stood back and said, do you want me to run this? So it was clear to everybody he was taking control and importantly, he was going to stand back so that he wasn't going to get involved in the actual intubation procedure. He was going to look at the whole patient. 
Um, importantly, he took the algorithm straight off the wall. So he was using a well-recognized algorithm and checklist to guide interventions and prevent repetition of already failed techniques. One of the things I particularly liked, um, again, it comes with effective leadership, he wasn't just waiting until um, the problem arose. He was already a step ahead. So if this doesn't work, we're going to do this. And even when he had control of the airway at the end, if this fails, we're going to do this. So he was already planning for all eventualities. He was thinking out loud. He was sharing his thinking with the team. He was encouraging them to give their input. And at the end, one of the nurses actually said, I don't think we should be messing about with the airway. It's pretty precarious. I think we should wake her up. So she felt confident in that situation to raise her concerns for her patient. And for me, the one thing that is really different is the effect of leadership. And I think for all of you who, again, are focused just on knowledge and skills, hopefully this talk will serve as an eye-opener to just how important leadership is. The people involved in the Elaine Bromley case had good knowledge and skills, but they fell into traps with leadership and human factors that we're all susceptible to. And we need to learn from this case. We need to lead effectively. And we have to recognize that we're just as at risk as the people involved in the case. And we need to set up our behavior. We need to look at our systems to try and prevent this from happening. And we need to lead effectively. So hopefully you'll go away feeling inspired like I did when I had the case discussion with my consultant, I wanted to go away. I hadn't been considering this before. I went away excited. This was something new, something I had been neglected, and I wanted to find out everything I could about it. So hopefully for some of you, you'll get this from this talk. Your eyes will be opened to something that you weren't considering that has the potential to make a massive difference to your patients. What I would encourage you to do is to go away and reflect in your own practice. How can I start bringing some of this stuff in? And then to start trying it. It will make a real difference to the care you deliver to your patients. Thanks for listening.